Order, please. We'll call the Standing Committee and Public Accounts to order. And uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone here this morning. And just a few short reminders. Uh, anybody that has their phones with them, please place them on either silent or vibrate. And we're going to begin with the committee members introducing themselves. We'll start here, go down, and then we'll come back up on the back. So we'll start with Ms. Roberts. Good morning, welcome. I'm Lisa Roberts, the MLA for Halifax Needham. Good morning and welcome. Tim Hallman, MLA for Dartmouth East. Good morning, everyone. Keith Irving, MLA King South. Good morning, folks. Ben Jessam, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good morning, I'm Margaret Miller, the MLA for Hans East. Good morning and welcome. Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good morning, Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Okay, thank you. Just a couple of reminders before we start. Uh, you're asked to keep your mask on during the meeting, unless you are speaking, and I make myself an exception because I'm over here to allow the, the free flow of conversation to go back and forth, but I think we have our, our distancing done anyway. So. so in an effort to keep uh, limit the movement within the chamber, and we just ask everybody to remain in their seat as much as possible. And to accommodate this, we're going to take a short break after the first hour for about 15 minutes. But in order to do that, I'd have to ask the committee members uh, for agreement to extend the meeting by 15 minutes at the end. Is it agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And finally, when leaving the chamber, please use the side exits and re-enter through the chamber doors. So I think that pretty much covers all the lead up to today's meeting. On today's agenda, we have officials from Department of Health and Wellness, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, and Nova Scotia Lands to discuss the QE2 New Generation Project, Halifax Infirmary Expansion, and Community Outpatient Center, Outpatient Center Phase 2 from the July 14th, 2020 report of the Auditor General. So with that, we'll ask the witnesses to introduce themselves and we'll start. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Janine Lagasse, Associate Deputy Minister, Health and Wellness. Paul LaFleck, Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, Deputy Minister. John O'Connor, uh, Nova Scotia Lands. Uh, Gary Porter, Senior Director, Procurement and Finance, Nova Scotia Lands. Dr. Alex Mitchell, Senior Medical Director, QE2 New Gener New David Benoit, Senior Executive Director, Strategic Infrastructure Planning, Department of Health and Wellness. Thank you. In attendance, we also have representatives from the Auditor General's Office, the Clerk's Office, uh, Ledge Council, and Hanser. So with that, we'll ask the witnesses to begin to, with their opening remarks. Ms. Legacy. Mr. O'Connor. Good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. On behalf of myself, the Deputy Minister, and my fellow witnesses, thank you for the opportunity to return to the committee to discuss the QE2 New Generation uh, Project. My name is John O'Connor. I'm the Vice President of the uh, Healthcare Infrastructure Projects Division uh, at Nova Scotia Lands and uh, the lead for the uh, provincial government for the new QE2 uh, new generation project. I'm joined today by Deputy Minister Paul LaFleche. Uh, just introductions have been completed. Gary Porter to my right and Dr. Mitchell beh behind me. In addition to addressing your questions, we are here today to respond to the Auditor General's most recent report on our project. The redevelopment of the QE2 Health Sciences Center is a once in a generation opportunity to rethink and rebuild the way we deliver health care. This isn't just a construction project, it's the foundation of our next 50 years of health care. As the largest infrastructure project ever undertaken in Nova Scotia, the QB2 New Generation Project is complex and ambitious. Two significant pieces in this important redevelopment are the expansion of the Halifax Infirmary and the construction of the Bears Lake Community Outpatient Centre. 
These two projects were highlighted in the Auditor General's July report. The report noted that our approach in selecting a DBFM, Design, Bill, Finance, Maintain delivery model for the two projects, as well as our methodology for developing a master plan for the two projects, were both reasonable and appropriate. This endorsement supports a great deal of work that has taken place since January of 2020, particularly in regard to the Bears Lake project, which we are pleased to say is underway and getting closer to reality. In August of 2020, Ellis Dawn Infrastructure Healthcare was awarded the contract to design, build, finance, and maintain the new community outpatient center. And we are eagerly looking forward to a planned construction start later this month. This is an exciting milestone. Breaking ground on the Bears Lake project is a huge step towards our goal of providing Nova Scotians with easier access to modern, high quality supports and care closer to home. In addition to the planned construction start, we also recently received an updated value for money, or VFM, analysis for the Bears Lake Outpatient Centre project. The results of the value for money confirm that the province should expect overall lifetime risk adjusted costs of the Bears Lake project to be over 35 million less through the DBFM arrangement as compared to a traditional model. That is a reduction of nearly 15%. Supported by this analysis, we are confident that our selected delivery model and our project approach will realize the maximum benefits possible for all Nova Scotians. I want to assure, assure the, this committee that our team is working diligently to advance the QE2 new generation project efficiently and in accordance with best practices. We are engaging experienced and qualified partners. We are working closely and in collaboration with the Nova Scotia Health Authority colleagues, the Department of Health and Wellness, and other government departments. And we are advancing the Auditor General's recommendations to ensure appropriate oversight and governance. In closing, I want to thank the Auditor General and his staff for the work they have done in evaluating our project. Mr. Chair, thank you very much for this time. My colleagues and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Lepleuch. I'd like to, I know I'm not allowed to officially hand this to anyone like we usually do, but this is the project development report for Bears Lake Community Outpatient Centre. We have uh, promised that we would deliver this type of report uh, in the future, and the future has arrived. Um, so I'm officially tabling it. Um, it is available immediately on the website healthredevelopmentnovascotia.ca, and uh, uh, we will ensure that the clerk uh, gets, a, gets the uh, sufficient access to it to produce it with the documents. Thank you. I was going to suggest you give it to the clerk anyway. So. Well, we're not allowed. <laughs> Apparently, my just hands leave, are leave. my hands are germy. Just, just leave <laughs> it on your desk. <laughs> Ms. Lega, say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, committee members. Thank you for inviting the Department of Health and Wellness to join our colleagues from the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal and Nova Scotia Lands to meet with you today. We are happy to be here today to discuss the Auditor General's most recent report on the QE2 New Generation Project. As Mr. O'Connor noted, the QE2 New Generation Project is the largest healthcare project in Nova Scotia's history. This once in a generation initiative will see new and renovated operating rooms, relocated cancer care services, the construction of a new community outpatient centre and much more. This project will transform how some of the province's most specialized health services are delivered and ensure we will continue to provide outstanding health care to Nova Scotians. As you would expect with a project of this size and scope, there are many people and stakeholders connected and contributing in various ways. We continue to work closely with Nova Scotia Health Authority, Nova Scotia Lands, the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, and others to ensure proper oversight for the project is in place. We appreciate the recommendations that the Auditor General has made to strengthen the governance and project management as the project moves forward. 
to further support the Department of Health and Wellness in its oversight role. We recently established a new branch led by Mr. Benoit, who's with me here today, to, co to work collaboratively with our partners to better coordinate the significant health care infrastructure projects we have underway across the province. These projects include the QE2 New Generation Project, the CBRM Healthcare Redevelopment Project, the South Shore Redevelopment Project, emergency department renovations, and new dialysis sites. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have been felt in all parts of our healthcare system, including our infrastructure and construction projects. We continue to respond in a rapidly changing and uncertain situation. As we learn more about the virus, we have adopted our approach. We will continue to monitor the costs of goods and services, delivery dates, and productivity across all infrastructure projects. COVID-19 will continue to be a key consideration in our healthcare delivery and in our infrastructure projects moving forward. In our recent infrastructure projects, we have been exploring ways to innovate and do things differently, and we have seen some success. The new Waterford Community Hub will see a school, health centre and long-term care home located together in the same area. This approach is unique to our province and will create learning opportunities for students and bring community resources together in one place. We look forward to the continued work with our partners to find innovative approaches to new healthcare infrastructure. In closing, I want the committee members to know that we are working diligently with our partners here today others across government to move forward the QE2 New Generation project. As the Auditor General noted in his most recent report, the project is progressing well and we continue to implement his recommendations to improve, strengthen our oversight and governance. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear here today. Thank you and we'll begin now with the first round of questioning, 20 minutes per caucus for the first round. Begin with the PC caucus, Mr. Hallman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Lee O'Connor, thank you very much for your uh, opening remarks. Uh, thank you to all uh, officials here for the ongoing work you do on behalf of the residents of Nova Scotia. It is certainly appreciated. Uh, that being said, uh, Mr. O'Connor, uh, you, you made a statement that was very, very profound. It, it captures what this project is all about. This is the foundation for the next 50 years uh, of health care. And certainly, I know members of the committee here um, this project they don't take lightly. This is a, a project of great importance to, um, to the vitality uh, of Nova Scotia uh, and certainly as someone who, who lived with a sick partner uh, at, uh, at the Centennial uh, for a month's time, I know how critical it is that this project uh, gets going. Um, it seems obvious to me though that um, you know, before we build something new, we need to know what we, what we already have before we build more. So maybe this question is more appropriate for Ms. Legasse. Uh, what are the current utilization rates uh, of the beds uh, at the HI at the moment? Ms. Legasse. At the HI specifically, I cannot answer that, that, that specific of a question. I do know that our bed utilization rates are quite high right now across the province. Mr. Hobbin. Does the, does the department keep data statistics on, on how, you know, how many beds are being utilized? Do we keep data on that? Ms. Legasse. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, the data would be kept with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. I'm not sure if Dr. Mitchell may be able to help us to answer that question, but we do receive information from the NSHA on bed utilization, yes. Mr. Hobbin. Is that information you can get the committee, please? I think Nova Scotians would want to know how we're utilizing existing infrastructure at the moment. Uh, to me, I think that would be, you know, as we build, as we, as we add something new, I think we obviously need to know how we're using the existing infrastructure to maximize health care uh, outcomes. Uh, so again, is there, is there any data you can provide on, on utilization rates? Ms. Legasek? Overall utilization right now, I believe, is around, it's, it's over 80% across the province. Mr. Hallman. Okay, and would you be able to provide some information on how many beds are occupied by patients that are ready for discharge 
as a percentage of the number of beds. Ms. Legasse. I do not have that specific of data with me here today, no, but we would be able to, I would be able to check on that. Mr. Hobbin. Again, uh, you know, Mr. Chair, as I was saying, you know, as we, as we expand this, this is the largest capital uh, investment in the history of our province. Uh, I think obviously uh, in terms of uh, just transparency, uh, I think Nova Scotians, you know, want to know how it is we're utilizing the existing infrastructure. Um, okay, so after work is completed uh, with the Halifax Infirmary, with the rebuild, uh, how many critical care rooms will be added from the current numbers? Mr. Mitchell. Uh, sure. So uh, the critical care numbers, I'll have to probably get back to you with the exact number. I believe we're at uh, 24 currently uh, with an expansion to 36 critical care beds plus an additional 12 IMCU beds. Mr. Hum. So the statement you just made, are you stating that from a place of certainty? Uh, again, these are, these are massive investments we're, we're putting in. Uh, what you just stated is that you're quite certain um, because I, I, get, I get a sense there's a bit of vagueness here. Mr. Mitchell. If I could have a moment, I will uh, get the exact numbers for you. Mr. Hobbin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how many additional rooms for the medical and surgical unit will be added from the current numbers? Mr. Mitchell. not have the exact number and I apologize while looking for that I did not hear your second question sir. Mr. Hobbin. <clears throat> so the question is how many additional rooms for the medical and surgical unit uh, will be added from the current numbers? Mr. Mitchell. Number that we have to get back to you I think one thing to emphasize that there are a few places with expansion of capacity uh, uh, but that the uh, uh, ultimate uh, uh, first goal of this is to replace the uh, capacity at the existing VG. Uh, but the exact number of the uh, bed delta, um, I believe is what you're asking, is, is not rooms but number of beds uh, that is in adjustment from the current state. We can get you that exact number. Mr. LaFleche. It's important to realize too that the question is a moving target in that uh, we have already completed some expansion. So uh, uh, we probably, we will look to back to before we started any expansion at all, where were we in beds and where are we gonna end up at beds after we finished all the expansion. So I'm including things like Hans, Dartmouth, et cetera. So we have to understand our base before we give you the answer. So that'll take a little bit of calculation. Mr. Hum. Mr. Le Mr. LaFleche, that's my exact point. Um, the expectation is that we understand our base at this point. By understanding the base, we have a clear picture of where we're moving forward. So is it correct to say that it's unknown the total increase of rooms for the expanded inpatient center from current numbers? Is that a correct statement? Mr. O'Connor. I'd like just to clarify, uh, we, we have all of this information, we just didn't come prepared with it today. It's in the master planning documents, it's work that we have completed uh, over the last number of years, it's just that we don't uh, sort of have it at our fingertips here today. Uh, we definitely have um, a program that was um, being replaced at the, uh, from the VG, some of the program has gone to Dartmouth General uh, as part of the renovations and additions at Dartmouth General. Uh, some of the program is going to to um, the, the Bayers Lake Community Outpatient Centre and the remainder of the program, some of the program has gone to uh, Hans, uh, and then the remainder of the program is going to be housed in the new construction and renovations at HI. We definitely have all of the data, it's just that uh, we didn't come prepared with all of that data today. So I want to, re uh, I want to assure the committee 
that all of that data is well known, it's well established. I think it's something like 36 additional beds or 38. I'm just going by memory, so it's a bit dangerous. But uh, there are uh, uh, some increase in the total bed count overall, and uh, we can get you those numbers for sure. So I actually can confirm it is 38. Mr. Mitchell. I'm sorry, I can confirm it is 38 beds. Mr. Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, surely, um, you know, since this is the foundation of our health care system for the next 50 years, it's obviously the hope of Nova Scotians that, you know, straightforward questions such as this uh, could be, could be uh, answered and clarified here at public accounts. Um, okay, so just, just another quick question. Uh, of the new rooms, how many of those new rooms will be cohabited? Mr. Mitchell. So again, the, so it's limited. Uh, there's a, uh, the majority of the new rooms are private rooms, uh, but there is a limited capacity of, I believe, two-person rooms in the new build. The exact number, again, uh, not at my fingertips, but we can provide that to you. Mr. Hum. Oh, and thank you. I mean, obviously, that's a relevant question given everything that's transpired in the last few months here in, here in Nova Scotia. I mean, that, that is a question that is on the minds uh, of Nova Scotians. Um, Will different genders be placed in the same rooms? Mr. Mitchell. Uh, so recognizing that currently I sit and work on the redevelopment side of the health authority and not on the operations side, I am well aware that over the last number of years in order to efficiently utilize beds, uh, there has been a move to cohabitate uh, male and female patients in the same room where sometimes necessary. It's not preferred in terms of what their active uh, procedure is with that today and in the last several weeks. I'm not sure where they're at with that, but I can certainly get an updated statement from the health authority for you. Mr. Hub. Well, thank you. That'd be greatly appreciated. Um, can you outline uh, what projections, demographic projections, studies uh, were used to design this, this building? Mr. Mitchell. Sure. So um, uh, a sizable amount of effort and work was conducted by a variety of different professionals to assess the current state, uh, to uh, see what active ser existing service utilization was, to see what demographic trends were there. Uh, there were both uh, 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 clinical planners, functional planners, as well as professional epidemi epidemiologists that were engaged uh, to uh, look at the current state as they were looking at this to also project out uh, uh, what the patterns would be in HRM, what the disease patterns would be in terms of particular disease states related to various specialties, uh, the um, uh, change in our uh, age demographics, among other things. So a uh, thorough and deep uh, uh, exercise was done to assess that to the best of everybody's ability at that time. Mr. Hoffman. And will those analyses be made public? Mr. Mitchell. Uh, I think I would defer that to uh, my colleague, John Mr. O'Connor. Yes, uh, uh, I could stand corrected, but the documents that we posted on the master plan, uh, on the uh, website, the, all the master plan versions, gives a lot of the background of the assumptions that were made in all aspects from the, uh, from the uh, health care uh, um, requirements of the future compared to the programs that, uh, that exist today, and then as well as the infrastructure itself and its conditions and decisions that were made and that support the, uh, the uh, master planning uh, decisions. All of that's included in the master planning documents. Again, we didn't come fully prepared to that today because a lot of that we did during 2016 to 2018, and that forms the base or the foundation of the work as we are advancing since 2018. So a lot of that information is why it's now is, is fresh in our minds because uh, it, was, it, it was all documented and put together, but it's included in the, in the master plan, which forms the foundation of, uh, of our move forward to uh, the next levels of design and construction. Mr. Mitchell, you want to respond? Uh, the previous question about the number of double rooms, I have the exact number, which is 15 double rooms, one per pod at the present time in the current plan design. Mr. Hobb. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Um, with respect to the demogra demo demographic studies, uh, you indicated that there, you know, you looked at some patterns in HRM in terms of uh, health outcomes. Just as a Dartmouth MLA, I'm curious, what were some of the patterns in HRM that uh, were, were observed in that demographic study? 
Mr. Mitchell. Pardon me. Uh, uh, my first trip to public accounts, my apologies, sir. Um, uh, this, the specific details in that report with regards to disease prevalence or otherwise would be the kind of details I would not have at my fingertips, but certainly we can uh, um, uh, work to uh, get, obtain that information for you. Mr. Hum. So, so just going back to the projections, uh, were departments asked what they wanted or what they needed um, with respect to this rebuild? Uh, that internal consultation, what was indicated to you by, by departments in terms of, I guess, their wish list? Mr. Mitchell. So let's talk about the structure of how that all unfolds. Uh, so the planning of all this occurs over many years to reassure the committee uh, that that would involve uh, a number of different layers of the organization, starting with those at the front line. So those right at the coal face uh, are engaged representatives identified from different clinical units mm -hmm. to participate in the you know previous processes, also during the design processes. That mm -hmm. want list that you discuss is is the you know the functional programs. So that would have engaged. Uh, 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 some representation from frontline clinical care, both uh, physicians, nurses, and sometimes other allied health professionals. Uh, then the next layer up would be, uh, uh, you know, leadership and, and, and other, uh, you know, management director level individuals within those portfolios contributing to that, working in conjunction with the functional programmers, experts in looking at this information, asking people what they want in, in the context of, uh, you know, of a hospital build uh, with the appropriate layer of uh, filter to make sure that those wants are appropriate. And then above and beyond that, a redevelopment team of folks like myself and the rest of our teams uh, who are tasked with uh, gluing that all together, uh, making sure that uh, we're listening, making sure that we're rationalizing those wants and, and asks, uh, making sure that we're checking those against what the epidemiology and, and what, the, what the numbers say. Uh, and so that process has been ongoing for many years and those layers that I discussed still continue today through the design processes. Mr. Hobman, with about five minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the response. Um, have we res have we revisited any of the of these plans uh, since the onset of COVID nineteen? Mr. Mitchell. Apologies. Um, so yeah, this, this question's come up uh, in just about every forum and every room that I've entered in the last several months. So uh, COVID-19 has been a significant uh, uh, um, uh, event for everyone across the planet. Thankfully, in the healthcare and medicine concept, it actually isn't, it's a novel virus, but its behavior is similar to things that we've seen at a lower rate previously. So SARS, H1N1, gave everybody a real good scare a while back. And that gave a scare to the architects, the planners, the kind of people who think about hospital construction. So SARS and H1N1 was in the room as we were thinking about our designs. So things like airborne isolation rooms, it's a negative pressure room, you uh, uh, make sure that uh, the uh, air in that room is not getting out of that room. So in the current designs, there are negative pressure rooms uh, distributed throughout the new facility under the expectation that there may be an airborne illness. We didn't know COVID-19 was coming, but we'd seen H1N1 and we'd seen SARS before. So these were already in the room. Uh, what I'll confidently say is that uh, uh, we did uh, do a lessons learned and look back at our uh, Bears Lake design, which was pretty much completed. You know, the, the uh, financial close on Bears Lake and the proposed design for the COC uh, was there as COVID-19 essentially hit. It was pretty much done. And assessing that, that facility for what would that facility have looked like during a COVID-19 outbreak, and it would have functioned very well with the right seating capacity, hallway sizes, the right ability to put in plexiglass barriers, the right ability to separate people and scale back the volume of people in the building with the right air handlers and other things, that facility would have functioned quite well, in part because we had already begun to think about what it would look like to function in an environment with an airborne pa pandemic. Or I should, COVID-19 is not an airborne uh, illness, it's a droplet illness, but uh, in, in a similar type of virus. Mr. Hammond, three minutes. Thank you for the response. Um, with this rebuild, what can Nova Scotians expect in terms of reduction in wait times for diagnostic imaging? Uh, my time as an MLA, I've certainly heard concerns from residents about those wait times. Uh, so what are the projections on that? What can we anticipate to be those, those reductions in wait times for that, that critical service? Mr. Mitchell. 
so the specifics in how this facility will, act, you know, will uh, by the numbers reduce diagnostic imaging wait times, I don't have that specific number. But what I can say um, is that there is a number of efficiencies that are gained by the way that these new buildings are created. So the technology that goes into the building allows for better processing of patients through the building. So you can more efficiently move people. You can make much better sense in use of the day uh, and the day's work. Uh, the, as most diagnostic imag imaging technology advances, the speed with which it takes a picture, transmits that picture, and somebody's able to read that starts to improve. There's lots of technologies coming down uh, that allow for uh, uh, faster invest, you know, faster reporting to occur. Um, uh, uh, certainly, uh, the expectation is that the throughput and efficiency uh, that is gained by a modern building with modern supporting technology should significantly improve uh, their business. Uh, but the exact numbers and how that will play out, I, I can't tell you today. Mr. Harmon. So the exact numbers and how that will play out, what's the timeline when Nova Scotians will know the exact numbers and how this will play out? Uh, because I think we're now at the point where if this is the foundation of our healthcare system for the next 50 years, uh, it's a reasonable expectation on the part of Nova Scotians to, to, to know uh, answers to essentially simple questions like this. So, so am I correct to say that at this point we don't know what the reduction in wait times will be for diagnostic imaging? I mean, that was great in explaining the rationale, but is it correct to say we don't know what those reductions will be? Mr. Mitchell, can we get a response within about 35 seconds? Where I sit, I would be unable to answer that question today. That was good timing. So that, that uh, is the time for the PC caucus. Now we'll move to, for 20 minutes, the NDP caucus. We'll start with Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I just wanted to uh, clarify uh, Mr. O'Connor's remarks about the uh, uh, $35 million savings of the Bears Lake project through the design, build, finance, maintain uh, model. Um, according to the new value for money. So is the report that Mr. LaFleche referred to, that beautiful report that no one is allowed to touch, is that the value for money report? Or is that, that has the value for money in there? Mr. O'Connor. Yes. Ms. LeBlanc. Oh, what do you know? Um, thank you for bringing it today. Um, and uh, I'm, I have to say that I re really wish we could have seen it before this meeting because we don't get to see you very often, as you know, because of the democratic deficit that has occurred in the last six months uh, because of the pandemic and the government's response to not allowing uh, committees to meet safely. Um, so too bad that we weren't able to see the report before this meeting, because we would have loved to ask you some questions about that. But I, I will let that go for now, and I will... Um, uh, I'm happy that I'm on the record saying that. So, um, the last time we were together, however, I asked about the business case, uh, the release of the business case that explains the government's choice to use a P3 model over a traditional build. So, so far, we have not been able to see this analysis. So, I want to also, before I ask all of these questions, I want to clarify that that report does not include the value for money for the new generation, for the QE2. The, the HI site. Mr. O'Connor. The, the uh, value for money for Bears Lake has been re, uh, redone with the numbers, the actual bid numbers, uh, the results from the uh, procurement and the award, award of the contract to Alice Dawn. So we'll do the same when it gets to the HI project, the new bills at the HI. The value for money will be updated again and reported on. Mr. LeBlanc. So you'll report on it after all of the bidding is done and after all the procurement is done? Mr. O'Connor. Yes, that's the plan. Mr. LeBlanc. Right, and I guess I, I think through the last several months and possibly years, I've been saying that we really should see, the Nova Scotians should really see the value for money before the bidding is done to make sure that we don't get ourselves into a situation that we, uh, that we don't want to be in. Mr. O'Connor. Oh, Mr. LaFleche, sorry. Before, why we wouldn't do that, because we don't want the bidders, uh, no, some Nova Scotians may actually show it to the bidders, so uh, that would be not in our interest. So we do believe in transparency. We do want to put these reports out 
and we've done that in the past P3s we've done in recent history. I can't speak to the P3s who were done 30 years ago. So we will be putting out the value for monies as, uh, as each P3 is done. The next P3 will be the, bear, um, the infirmary and um, in the same sort of time scale when we get to the appropriate point and we feel we've gotten the best deal we can get for uh, Nova Scotians, we'll put out the value for money report. I realize that that doesn't um, satisfy those who want to know every detail up front and want to be in on the game, but I think what you should console yourself with um, is that we're doing the very best we can to make sure these projects are, interest, are in the interest of Nova Scotians and do deliver the very best value. We had a situation in Cape Breton where we started out down one road and after we did some of that work, we actually reversed ourselves. So. Uh, we, you know, we, we do carefully study this and ensure we're going down the right road. What I would say uh, to Ms., uh, the member across, Ms. LeBlanc, I, I can't remember what I'm supposed to call them, um, uh, that uh, look at the two previous value for monies we put out and, uh, and uh, study those and uh, you'll see the type of path we're on. That's the best we can do today, but I appreciate your concern and willingness uh, to see more. Ms. LeBlanc. Well, thank you, Mr. Flesh. I mean, I don't really want to be in the game, as you say, but I do want to make sure Nova Scotians are getting the best deal for their money. And I want to make sure that Nova Scotians, for the next 50 years, for this entirely amazing, great project that we're going to have, that we're going to have the best one possible. So we're going to leave that alone. Um, uh, as the, uh, so as I was saying before, so we don't have the value for money for that part of the report, but uh, and, and in the AG report, um, uh, it was pointed out that... Um, uh, we're all we are in a very different uh, global situation presently with COVID-19, et cetera, and there are key steps that we need to make sure are taken uh, so that this project is steered clear of the massive issues we know that plague the P3 model. So I have a couple of questions based on that. So can you tell us how was the public engaged in the development of the business case and consulted on the question of which project procurement model to use? Mr. O'Connor. I'd like to have Gary Porter take that question, please. Yeah, it's, it's, Mr. Sorry, Porter. Mr. Porter? Yeah. Ms. LeBlanc? Yeah, so how was the public engaged in the development of the business case, and how was the public consulted on the question of which project procurement model to use? Mr. Porter. Uh, and th this information is covered in the project development uh, report that was uh, was released today, and and the there was limited broad public consultation on the on the selection of the model. Uh, as as standard practice, there is there is a component early on in the business case where there's a market sounding uh, um, initiative that's taken. So this is where we consult with. Uh, industry designers, constructors, facility maintenance maintenance providers, uh, uh, you know, other uh, you know, large and small, local and and national, and in in this case, we consulted with 20 of those uh, those groups, and we look for their interest in the project. We look for them to identify any uh, issues or barriers they see with implementing the project, like labor availability, and, and it helps inform us in terms of how much market interest there is on the project that we put to market. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. Uh, how were organizations representing healthcare workers and clinicians uh, at like labor unions or Doctors Nova Scotia, for instance, consulted in the development of the business case and consulted on the question of which uh, project procurement to use? Mr. Parker? Um, the uh, so the question is the internal consul the in internal consultations within the healthcare sector yeah, on, the on, on the business case. So uh, there there were several uh, points in the in the process where we had a direct consultation with with representative members that would help inform decision making. So. Uh, specifically, uh, when we looked at the question of whether or not we bundle these two projects together in a single procurement or separate them out in, in distinctively different procurements, uh, which we ended up doing, uh, we would have consulted with, uh, with the uh, facility maintenance uh, 
uh, uh, staff within the within the health authority, uh, the financial uh, staff within the health authority. We would have included the Department of Health and Wellness. We would have included the uh, Department of Finance and Treasury Board, uh, along with our internal TIR resources that would help inform some of the questions. But it was a, a fairly limited uh, consultation process. Much of the consultation with the with uh, with with clinicians and uh, and and health authority staff really were around the engagement in the master planning process. So defining the what uh, the fac facility needed to include. Mr. LeBlanc. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I do think that um, consulting unions and uh, you're talking about uh, the maintenance staff and that kind of thing. So uh, did you consult with any labor unions that are present in the hospitals currently? Mr. Porter? Uh, not directly in this process. Mr. LaFleche? I, I can't answer the question of who exactly we consulted with on every project. Um, the NSHA staff, uh, Ms. Bond, unfortunately is ill today, and, uh, but she could tell you that. We'll try and get you an answer. I can tell you that the, um, the workers themselves were critical uh, into the input on whether we had went ahead with a P3 or not in Cape Breton, and their input uh, about how it would function on a P3 or not a P3 uh, was key to that decision to not do a P3 in Cape Breton and to really crystallize for us that in Cape Breton the P3 benefits unlike in Halifax would have been very marginal. So we do take into account those views. Ms. Bond who's not here could tell you up front who exactly we consulted with at what level. Uh, I can't but I know we did consult. Ms. LeBlanc. That seems to go against what Mr. Porter said, uh, Mr. Porter. Um, so um, I appreciate that, that that the workers were consulted in Cape Breton. I think that's excellent, and I think that that's uh, they're an, obviously an important voice. Uh, I also do understand that they would be more consulted during a, the master planning process. But in terms of a business case, they do have uh, input. So can can you clarify between the two of you, were the labor unions consulted, Mr. Porter? I, I can clarify. My answer was directly related to the Bayers Lake and Halifax Infirmary expansion, and not I, so I don't have a, a, a involvement in the Cape Breton uh, projects other than supporting some furniture and equipment uh, procurement. Uh, the one thing that's really important here, if if when you have a chance to look at the value for money report, you'll see the span of options that were were reviewed for consideration in a P3. And uh, you know, so on the on the f f far side of the spectrum of P3, we selected a DBFM, so design, build, finance, maintain. Right next to that is the DBFMO or OM, which is includes the operating of uh, of parts of the facility. So we do not have in scope operating aspects of the hospital within the scope of the P3. So portering, laundry, food services, all of the uh, uh, staffing that directly interacts with patients are not in scope of the, uh, of the contract uh, with Elliston. So those are still to be delivered directly by NSHA. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you for that clarification. Um, can you talk about what terms will be negotiated with contractors about transparency and public access to information about how the health facilities uh, will be managed during the next 30 years or the, the 30 year maintenance contract? Mr. Porter. Uh, sure, it's a that that right now is a is a work in pro progress. So we, you know, as we as you know, we recently closed the uh, the Bayers Lake uh, project agreement, which, which then initiates a number of activities. Uh, it uh, th so there's several committees that are struck. Uh, that focus on specific things that need to advance as part of the development. So the works committee, which is really focused on construction, we've got an equipment committee, a facility management committee that has some subcommittees around utilities and all of that sort of thing. Then there's an entire reporting regime around you know, how uh, progress is being made by each of those committees relative to construction and, and, and plans leading up to the operating uh, portion, which is you know, the facility operations, performance expectations, or, or performance objectives. Uh, and, and there's a few other things that really guide around, you know, how uh, communications occur that are actively being done right now. So there is a, 
uh, a portion of the project agreement that addresses uh, apprenticeship and community benefits. So it's really the Ellis Don's response to how they're going to engage apprentices in the, in the province and how they're going to engage the workforce. Sorry, I'm going to take this off for a moment. Uh, there's, uh, to complement that, there's a, a, a crisis communication plan, so if there were an event to occur on the site that requires a, you know, a crisis response, there's a, uh, a plan that addresses that in terms of how we respond, how Ellis Don responds, and how we've, we uh, transition that, uh, that process. And importantly, there's a communications plan that's developed jointly between the province and, uh, and Ellis Don that addresses a number of things, uh, uh, you know, broad communication, uh, the current lands uh, internal and external stakeholder identification, uh, specific uh, communications uh, strategies internally and externally, and th and that's currently being developed. In fact, it's it's uh, it's in the uh, it's in the later stages now. I expect within the next uh, the next month we'll be finalizing that communications plan. The crisis communication plan is now complete, and the apprenticeship and community ben benefits program will be uh, ongoing over the next uh, next several months. So there is really an active uh, response. Responsibility on on both parties uh, to uh, uh, to address communications proactively as as we move through the uh, through the period. Mr. LeBlanc, with about six minutes left. So um, you have already said that you will not uh, release the value for money uh, report uh, for the. HI site uh, until all of the bidding and procurement is finished. Would you consider releasing a version of the business case or the value for money scrubbed of information that you would feel would negatively impact the procurement process with the goal of informing Nova Scotians how you are so sure that the approach will be a good deal for the province? Mr. Leflesh. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we can take a look at something like that. What we don't want to do is affect uh, the, the benefits that Nova Scotians might accrue by getting a good deal. So we have to be very careful in what we do. That, that's the real issue here. So I think uh, Gary will take a look at that. Do you want to say something, Gary? Mr. Porter. Yeah, I, I actually would like to refer back to the Auditor General's report, and you know, this was an area that we we discussed with the Auditor General, and the Auditor General, uh, you know, had a look at, and and I think they concluded, and and I uh, could probably find the direct. Uh, the, the direct statement, but they opine that that they 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 believe that it's not in our interest, or they support our decision to not release uh, the business case data, as it would have a negative impact on the procurement uh, process. Ms. LeBlanc. Mm -hmm. I understand that rationale, but I'm just wondering if there's a possibility of like having it having a, at least like a, a shell of it, scrubbed of, of, of information so that we could have, get a sense. It's okay, we won't, I won't uh, continue on that point. I just want to move over to uh, risk transfer. Um, one of the ideas behind the rationale that a P3 model could provide a good deal for the province is that the province pays a premium in return for the private sector, in, in return for the private sector assuming the lion's share of the risk of the project. So first of all, could you explain exactly what the risk transfer equation in the business, is in the business case? So uh, that is, uh, what is the idea, or sorry, explain the idea that the private sector assumes risk for a premium price. Can you ex give some examples of risks that a contractor might assume. I, I understand the risk transfer idea. I just want to know some examples of the risks. Mr. Porter. Uh, and uh, the, the top three that, that probably account for the majority of the benefit that we've realized in this contract with, uh, with Ellis on our construction budget. Uh, so cost certainty, in other words. And, uh, and the uh, asset residual value at the end of 30 years. And so these, the, the value for money uh, uh, statement is a comparison to if we were to do those things ourselves, right? The fundamental difference is uh, when we would do this ourselves, we would separately contract for the design, we would separately contract for the constructor, we would uh, separately contract for the facility maintenance over the period of time, and we would, uh, we would uh, finance it on our own. Uh, the, uh, our, the evidence would suggest that when we do that, we face risks ourselves. So we face design risks. So when we change a design, 
uh, it, it impacts our design-related cost, which correspondingly impacts the construction-related cost. If we're in construction and we find change orders uh, are, are prevalent, then that leads back to design changes, leads to construction changes, scope increase, and that's where you see uh, see the, the, the risk retained by the province, you start to lose, lose the value. Uh, so we, uh, we took a very uh, empirical approach to evaluating our performance in the construction management uh, on our own compared to a DBFM, and we were able to, uh, to, to provide, I think, a solid uh, uh, rationale for the value for money that you see. So construction risk and, and asset residual value account for uh, close to 90% of the benefit of the 35 million. Ms. LeBlanc, about a minute and a half left. I'm going to speed through this. Uh, last number of months, we've seen many ways that uh, risk calculations can get turned upside down because of COVID-19, obviously. Supply chain disruptions, workforce stoppages, liability loggerheads have thrown the, uh, into question the typical assumptions that can be made around the kinds of risk encountered by large complex uh, projects. Uh, what exactly are the necessary changes to the risk transfer assumptions in the business case as a result of COVID-19? Mr. Porter. I, I, I don't know if I have time to answer that question. I desperately want to. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, uh, COVID in relation to our process happened in March, well, so March was the, was the pandemic. Our uh, submission uh, deadlines were uh, the following April, May. Uh, so we had the opportunity to ask the proponents to forget COVID happened and submit their bids as if it didn't. And we created a $5 million cash allowance and a negotiations process to address COVID-related impacts to their, to their project costs. And we asked them to submit with their, with their technical submission the types of things that they would see as impacting their cost to the project. That allowed us to enter into negotiations on those things. We focused on only costs that were, uh, were known, direct, and able to be quantified. And, and, that, and, and that helped inform the process. And I would also say that I think we, uh, we, we did very well in that process. Uh, and one of the reasons I think is that the nine months preceding that, that was the open period, we created a really collaborative process with the proponents and actively engaged them in solution focused discussions around this. So when we got to COVID, we already had good relationships established in terms of how we would address that. And we had some really productive discussions that allowed us to focus on the item, put a box around it and, and actually close on time. One of the few projects I think that was able to do that in midstream. Thank you. Uh, the time for the NDP caucus has expired. We'll go now to the Liberal caucus. Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of our guests here who uh, are spending the morning with us to review the Auditor General's report. Um, as has been said before by my colleagues, this is an extremely important uh, project for the province, uh, the biggest in its history, and, uh, and does uh, uh, influence healthcare delivery now for the next uh, half a century or so. Um, so, you know, we can un certainly understand uh, the public's interest and the opposition's interest in ensuring that good decisions are being made uh, throughout uh, the process. And uh, this Auditor General's report is really that first hard objective look at the decisions being made by government. And I do want to underscore the conclusion uh, by the Auditor General, and I'll quote from the, uh, the summary document, the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Ren Renewal conducted a reasonable and appropriate analysis to select a project delivery model for the Halifax Infirmary Expansion and the Community Outpatient Centre. So that is uh, very reassuring words, I think, for uh, all members of the legislature uh, that our uh, independent Auditor General who is uh, tasked with uh, uh, looking for gaps in decisions and financial decisions for the province uh, has given, uh, I think, a strong endorsement of the work to date. Lots, as they have said, there's also work to go, but we have a reasonable an appropriate analysis. So I was wondering if uh, uh, our witnesses can expand on the methodology used uh, with respect to choosing uh, this delivery model. Mr. Porter. 
Uh, th uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, and, and maybe I could just provide a, a little bit of a summary of what's included in the value for money report just by way of, of, of how the process was followed to arrive at that decision and, and ultimately what that led to. Uh, so, so the business case itself focused on a number of things. Uh, uh, obviously, the scope of development, we needed to make sure we understood the size and complexity of the development, both Bayers Lake and, and the Halifax Infirmary. That was largely informed by the master planning work that uh, had been un undertaken. Uh, then it, we went into what's called a bundling assessment. So that was a specific area of work that we wanted to understand in terms of uh, should we procure these projects together, uh, should we procure them separately, regardless of what method we use. And, uh, and, and so that was in informed by a number of things in terms of, of uh, you know, which, which model best suited, uh, suited the, uh, um, uh, the, the case. And, and what we found in that, there was marginally a better case to actually do them together. Uh, but when we conducted the, the next step, which was the market sounding, which involved both local and national constructors, designers, facility uh, maintenance providers, we found that, uh, that there were some benefits to separate separating them, most of which really around early delivery. So proceeding with Bayers Lake ahead of time allowed us to construct that facility sooner than if we had engaged in both of them together. Uh, secondly, uh, we concluded that it was there would be increased competition uh, through separating those uh, uh, separating those projects. Bayers Lake is of a size that uh, that would attract uh, you know local and national uh, partners. Halifax Infirmary or a combined site, Halifax Infirmary alone, uh, there's only a few uh, 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 groups that could actually take on a project of that size. And you know I think we see them now in our in our shortlist for for Halifax Infirmary, uh, Plenary and, and Elliston. Uh, Following that, we did a qualitative assessment. So that really uh, is where we focused on how to select the model uh, that, uh, that we selected. And, and that was done through a lot of consultation internally uh, around the, um, uh, the, the benefits of proceeding uh, with or looking at the various uh, models that we looked at. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, referring to some uh, some notes here, and the the focus of that really was around you know which model best suits us in terms of ownership and control, uh, managing against a project schedule, uh, achieving cost certainty and cash flow management, uh, market and interest and availability, ease of management, flexibility, risk mitigation and innovation. And after all that analysis, uh, it really pointed us directly to the, uh, to the DBFM or the design, build, finance and maintain model. Uh, from there, uh, we, we conducted the quantitative analysis. So that's where we compared the risk cost uh, comparison to, to doing it ourselves, uh, construction management as an agent compared to uh, DBFM and the associated costs. And in the earlier question, it talked about, you know, the risk transfer. This is where we see big benefits in terms of being able to transfer construction budget, construction schedule, and facility asset residual value uh, at the end of the day. And that was, again, as I stated earlier, done with supporting empirical evidence that looked at our, uh, our history of project completion. Uh, it looked at the current state of the uh, assets within the, uh, within the health sector and where they are, particularly if you look at the health Halifax Infirmary, I think, which is almost around 30 years old, it provided a good comparison to what a building could look like uh, based on current, uh, current practices with facility management. So we had some really good data that allowed us to conduct that analysis and, and provide a, a, a fair comparison. And ultimately, that led to uh, and supported the decision to proceed with a, a design, build, finance, maintain. Uh, hopefully, that answers your question. Mr. Irving. Yes, thank you. That was uh, very helpful. Um, uh, and I, I do want to note the comments uh, from the Deputy Minister in that a similar process was done with respect to Cape Breton and a decision was made not to use the P3 model for that particular project based on uh, the, the evidence of that project relative to this. So I think it's important uh, for Nova Scotians to know that this is not a 
These are not a philosophical decisions that we're for or against P3s, but it's based on the evidence and how we get the best value for money uh, for Nova Scotians. Um, so my follow-up question <coughs> here is, uh, we've got two projects uh, which are uh, underway, but one is ahead of the other. So we're further down the road on the Community Outpatient Centre. Are there any lessons or takeaways from getting to the stage that we've gotten with the, the smaller budget, uh, the, uh, the outpatient centre, that uh, can help us enhance uh, uh, our, the next larger project? Mr. O'Connor. We'll turn it over to Gary as well uh, in some detail, but absolutely. Absolutely, it's one of the better decisions that were, was made was to uh, to advance one ahead of the other. And given that the Bayers Lake project is uh, a smaller project, um, it was uh, able to uh, we were able to manage through it uh, very well. And all of the experience that we have gained, and uh, the experience with our uh, our advisors. And the, the, they were experienced anyway as we brought them on as advisors, but our experience in working with them, learning from them, and all of the lessons learned uh, from the process that we have gone from A to Z on for, for Bayer's Lake um, are, are uh, being uh, you know, embedded into our work for the HI project. So with the HI project, we're very close now uh, to RFP release. We have some... Um, uh, uh, governance uh, discussions to have w over uh, with uh, with some of our oversight committees to get the uh, final okay uh, to have that RFP release, but we're just at the very early stages now of uh, putting that out to to those two shortlisted bidders, and we'll have uh, years later later we'll be in a position that we were in August or July and August for Bayers Lake. So absolutely uh, many lessons learned, and Gary, I know, uh, has uh, conducted uh, a number of lesson learned um, uh, feedback uh, loops there to, to really capture from all different uh, um, aspects you know, of what, what was good, what was bad, what worked, what didn't work, and, and I think uh, we're in a good position now, and we've embedded a lot of that in the RFP documents um, already that, that are being prepared and ready to release. We'll, yeah, we'll go to Mr. Porter first, and then we'll go to Mr. Laplace. Yes, thank you, thank you, John. And and you know this, in, and to John's point, in hindsight, the separation of these two projects uh, into sing, to individual procurements, I think, has proved very, very beneficial. We we learned a lot through Bayers Lake. Uh, we we took a really deliberate approach after Bayers Lake to to really try to understand what worked well that we should build on, uh, what were we challenged with through the process that we should brace ourselves for the next time and how might we uh, we modify the process uh, to support what we've learned through Bayer's Lake. And I, and I would say overall, there's just a few key things that I would point out. I obviously can't talk a lot about what we're going to do with Elifax Infirmary until the proponents actually see the document so they don't hear it today versus when we officially give it to them. But I, I think some of the observations are important. Um, we engaged in a really collaborative process. So uh, during the open period, uh, there are several consultations that occur. We're really negotiating the project agreement over that course of time. And there's several commercially confidential meetings where proponents engage us in, you know, trying to understand and clarify some of the contractual language, uh, maybe pushing back on some things that, that uh, they don't like in it. We try to embed some things in there that we'd like to see uh, within the contract. Uh, the second process that is underway at the same time is there's a series of design presentation meetings, which is really clarifying our requirements to bidders and and what we want to see in the facility, what's essential and what can't change, what what has has room for modification uh, that might enhance clinical care or uh, or or cost efficiency. Uh, so. Engaging those discussions in a really collaborative way, I think, was really beneficial. We had three uh, great proponents that that uh, that were really solution focused. When we encountered issues or items that we wanted to discuss, it was done so in a really collaborative way. Uh, that really helped us in addressing COVID. So, having had to establish those relationships, it really allowed us to, and to you know establish a trusting dialogue around uh, around that. Um, uh, second thing I would say is that the open period for Bayer's Lake uh, was 
challenging in the sense that uh, the amount of time we had. Uh, so we, uh, we, we have modified the uh, Halifax Infirmary open period uh, slightly. Uh, we, so the, the time that we set, which we will release as part of our RFP, was re really very much informed on what we learned from Bayers Lake, the amount of time we need to engage proponents on design-related items, allowing the right amount of innovation, uh, discussing that kind of innovation. The one benefit that we have, a real technical uh, piece, is that all of the work that we did on the project agreement and all the language and all the adaptations to the, to the language and the various schedules, uh, our starting point for Halifax Infirmary is where we ended off in Bayers Lake. So we won't have to replicate all of those discussions over again. The proponents are already familiar with the language. They've already uh, opined on the language. They've uh, they've accepted it. I think if there is an area that you know we'll we'll, we'll continue to work towards is you know the ongoing impact of COVID and and how that may change uh, in time. So that's a dialogue that we'll uh, assume we'll enter into with uh, with proponents and. We have the benefit of what we've done with Bayers Lake uh, to help inform that. I think the other thing that just is worth saying and goes to some of our governance and capabilities, like we've we've built our cap capability quite significantly since we embarked in the beginning on Bayers Lake. So our strength in entering into this process in terms of you know our clinicians and their understanding of the requirements, their ability to talk about what was intended by what we're saying we need, uh, the ab ability to push back on some stuff we don't want any change to the, the ability to engage in things that we'd like to see some innovation around like I think we're so much better positioned in this process now uh, that uh, that will really uh, really pay off as part of the uh, part of the process Mr. LaFleche so uh, I think it's important uh, Gary and, and John have gone over the continuum between Bayers Lake to the infirmary and what lessons we learn but it's important to understand that we and others have been in P3 projects and conventional projects for a long, long time. Nova Scotia was one of the leaders in Canada in P3 projects. In fact, if you go to any of the, the conferences, they still talk about what a breakthrough it was when Nova Scotia launched the schools project uh, in the uh, mid-90s. That's viewed to be a success. It's not viewed to be a success in some political or media venues, but in terms of P3s, and government construction, they're viewed to be successes. We then went into a bit of a low, a lull. Uh, we did those projects in schools for different reasons and different accounting reasons uh, in different times. We went into a bit of a low, but then we relaunched P3s in the McDonald government and uh, continued in the Dexter government, he's up there, and uh, went through to the McNeil government. And we've done a number of P3s now. Um, they're mentioned in some of the reports by the Auditor General. A lot of people don't even know they were P3s. Every single one of those P3s we have learned lessons from, which are translated to these things we're doing today. In fact, the one right before Bears Lake, Highway 104, which is under construction now, we learned from lessons there in negotiating that contract that we've used in Bears Lake and are now going to the infirmary. We've also done extensive work across Canada in looking what others when we went into a lull in the early 2000s in P3s and others passed us and did a lot of them based on our first experiences, we learned from them. We went to visit. What do they do in BC? What do they do in Ontario? What do they do in Alberta? So we've, we've had a lot of learning and, you know, every P3 is situational, but you can learn from the past. Every conventional build is situational. There's not really anything that's P3 or conventional. If you look at the Auditor General's reports and you like letters of the alphabet, you can find there's about 10 different types of builds one can do along the spectrum. And I encourage you to go look at that. It's a really good report and it's got really good definitions of what they are. We've done almost all of those builds. Each one is good for some situation and you learn when you do them uh, so you do better in the future. Conventional builds, if I say strictly conventional, they actually don't exist um, because government doesn't have workers that actually build the facility. But if we get near conventional, um, they have their risks. We've seen that in the Colchester Hospital. Uh, P3s have their risks. Everything in between has a risk. We learn, we do our best. What is our objective? Our objective is to, to deliver value for money for Nova Scotians. 
Our objective here is to have a really good health care facility that addresses some of the questions that was at, were asked by Mr. Hallman earlier regarding wait times, regarding what are we getting in terms of beds, how are we delivering better health services uh, to Nova Scotians. That's the real objective. The building is just a means to get there. My colleague here on the left, Janine Legasse and Dr. Mitchell, they're more familiar with that. They could tell you more about that. But we want to make sure that we get the best building for them, and we've consulted vastly and widely with clinicians, with unions. I've heard from Mrs. Bond, and she will speak to you, uh, Suzanne LeBlanc, uh, about we have a council of unions we consult with along the way. So there's a, a much bigger process than was elaborated on here. Ms. Bond will get back to you on that. Um, so that's our objective. It's about health care facilities. Sometimes we talk a lot about the building, but it's about health care and health care for Nova Scotians and the best health care. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Irving, you have a minute and a half left. I was going to pass that along to my colleague. Thanks. Mr. Jessup. <laughs> Thanks for that minute and a half, Coach. Um, does anybody have a short snapper? I have a short snapper. Okay. Thank you. And maybe it's, it's part of the comment that I was going to start with. Um, there was nobody who was more excited when I heard about the Bears Lake um, uh, location just because the three biggest ridings or that area has grown so much. And as a, as a worker who, who drove and to the parking lot in downtown, how hard it was for patients and for myself to find parking downtown. This, to me, uh, this development of moving all the health services or the ambulatory health services to where people live was a really visionary uh, and, and, and a wonderful thing that will be used. Uh, I, I do actually think that Bears Lake offers so much more than has been said um, because of the highway access. I actually feel that it may be too small to the demand that is going to come onto Bayers Lake because of the highway access, because of this increased population in the three, uh, in, in uh, Bedford, Clayton Park, and, and Fairview area, and the rest that will be uh, serviced in that location. We are all so excited for that one, and I hope it, it, uh, it goes uh, on time. But the, the quick question is, uh, is, is the... Is it big enough for the demand, or how did you as uh, assemble the demand for that location? Uh, the time for the Liberal caucus has expired. Maybe we can get an answer to that in the second round of questioning. So what we're going to do now is take a 15-minute break. Again, I want to remind everybody, you exit through the two side doors, uh, have your mask on, and when you come back, you come in through the, through the main door. So we will resume again at 10.30.
order, please. We'll call the committee back to order. Uh, we'll begin now at the second round of questioning. The questions will be eight minutes for each caucus. Begin with the PC caucus, Mr. Hallman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to turn our attention to the Bears Lake Community Outpatient uh, Center. Uh, so at this uh, outpatient center, how many additional Nova Scotians will be able to receive uh, physiotherapy, occupational um, therapy, essentially rehab services? Uh, could you provide us some commentary on that? Mr. Mitchell. I'll get this right by the time it ends. Um, uh, so the, I do have specific numbers on number of volumes of visits at the COC. The total number of visits at the COC would be 207,000 and change. Uh, and of that, the OAC and rehab numbers are projected currently at approximately 36,000 visits. Uh, and it is our expectation that that will service uh, in the manner that was described earlier and that it will provide uh, service to both the local community, but most importantly, it uh, provides a really great point of entry for uh, patients coming to access those services from outside HRM or from outlying areas. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know we'd all acknowledge how critical uh, access to mental health services uh, is to Nova Scotians. Uh, certainly, COVID-19 has amplified uh, the need for that. Um, so based on that, um, how, many, uh, how many additional people will be able to be treated for mental health services at, uh, at the Bears Lake facility? Mr. Mitchell. Two layers to the answer on that question. Um, one is there is not specifically a mental health or psychiatry services footprint at the COC in its current clinical service plan. Uh, however, it is important to recognize that a sizable component of mental health services is provided by primary care and there is a primary care footprint that is significant at that site uh, with the ability to uh, um, uh, be utilized uh, thoroughly um, uh, in terms of how mental health, the, the clinical services plan for mental health care in conjunction with this, I, I can't speak to today, but there is not a specific mental health footprint at this site. Mr. Hobbin. So how will it play out then if, if once this is built and operational and a uh, Nova Scotian arrives at Bears Lake uh, to ac access mental health services, uh, what does the footprint look like? Uh, what, what will be the protocols? What will what services will they receive? If not there, where do they, where are they sent? Mr. Mitchell. Uh, sorry, so if we're talking about somebody in a mental health crisis, is that, you know, so somebody in a mental health crisis turns up the, at the Bears Lake Community Outpatient Center, um, there are, uh, and we can provide them, but there would be uh, a facility-based policies and protocols uh, for the management of a, a mental health crisis uh, individual. Um, uh, and uh, that would direct that patient depending on the circumstances to the appropriate level of care, the appropriate location of care, among other things. So that, that's something that we do, or the organization has to do every single day, uh, depending on what comes through the doors at various sites, and that would be no different than at the COC. Those, those standard policies and procedures would be followed. Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, with respect to administrative, administrative offices, uh, how much space is being allocated uh, for administration offices uh, at the Halifax Infirmary. Mr. Mitchell. So the specific square footage allocated to administrative office space would be a number that I'm, I'd be unable to provide you immediately at this time. What I can tell you is that the principles behind the project were to maximize the placement of clinical activity, mission critical, patient-centric activities to the new buildings, uh, into the new buildings which were being purpose-built to be efficient, to meet a modern and future standard, uh, and subject to the M portion of this contract. The beauty of this thing is that there is an outside third party who is uh, contracted to make sure that the lights are on, that building works and is perfect every day for providing patient care. So we want to make sure that we have patient care in those new buildings, and then direct the administrative, the non-clinical functions, care functions as much as possible into other components of the comp project in our existing buildings, uh, et cetera, so that we maximize the utilization of this investment in frontline clinical care. Mr. Hall. 
I appreciate that, Dr. Mitchell. I mean, I asked because someone very close to me used to work on 7.3, the Division of Neurosurgery, and that's one thing that struck me when I would visit, just, you know, the amount of, uh, not specific to that floor, but just overall the amount of administrative uh, offices. Um, so that being said, um, with respect to Bears Lake, how much space is being uh, allocated to administrative offices at Bears Lake? Mr. Mitchell. Maybe I won't get it right by the time we're done, but um, uh, uh, the, I can't tell, again, I can't tell you the exact square footage. I can close my eyes and I can picture the exact district that the administrative functions are in that building and is on the uh, ground or basement floor in that building uh, in the back left corner. And it is a small, very small, insignificant component of that building's function. Uh, the rest of that building is dedicated uh, to the clients, to the patients, to the community and for the things they will do in that building. Mr. Harmon, two and a half minutes. One of the, one of the, one, an article that recently, fairly recently struck me was an article by Dr. Bernie uh, Badley in the Chronicle Herald, and that was published on February 5th of 2020. Um, I'd like to take a quote from that Chronicle Herald article. Uh, quote, uh, proposed consolidation of all cancer services in Halifax would involve destruction of the existing structures that have not outlived their usefulness, uh, end quote. And, uh, the doctor, of course, as you know, is talking about the Dixon Center, which was opened in, in 1982. How has his concerns, and those are the friends of the commons, um, how, have that, that, how has that been taken into consideration in the development of this, of this, uh, of this plan? Mr. Mitchell. Okay, I think there's three layers there, okay? So let's start with Dr. Badley's comments about the Cancer Center and its pre-existing capacity or ability to provide care well into the future. And I think uh, any and all of us that are involved in uh, creating these facilities would challenge that assumption. The Dixon Building is not a building that is built to survive the next 30 years. And significant analysis before my time was done uh, to decide whether or not that building should be replaced, whether cancer care should be located concurrent with other things. And I would challenge us all to ask patients and our clients whether or not uh, they want to have their cancer care uh, in a variety of different locations or have their clinicians uh, uh, co-located, discussing collaboratively uh, and providing care that is centered really around the patient experience. And a lot of those factors, along with building condition uh, and the cost involved with maintaining, upgrading, and keeping that Dixon building going, were all entertained with an end result that the best for all, including finances, was probably to move that cancer center up the road. Part two of your question is on the uh, Friends of the Common uh, issue, and I believe uh, you'll see in our upgraded um, you know, master plan uh, diagrams or other things is that a lot of that has been addressed. There were concerns about the, the way that we need to move the cancer center up, the ambulatory care building, which required some element of our uh, structures to be across the road or on common land, among other things. And what you'll see in the updated uh, uh, design plans is an accommodation of that, of some significant uh, innovation in moving the buildings together in maximizing the use of the existing campus and capacity so that we do get that wonderful dream of having cancer care co-located co with everything else, uh, which I think will be high, we, we know will be highly celebrated by both patients and is currently being celebrated by the clinical staff involved in cancer and cancer care. Sorry, the time for the PC caucus has expired. I'm going to add an extra 30 seconds on to the NDP caucus. Uh, Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, glad to be here and to have this opportunity to ask some questions. Um, I'm going to start with uh, one building uh, on the HI campus that isn't being touched um, by this project, which is the Abby J. Lane Memorial Building for Psychiatric Care, uh, which is outdated and in need of, of something major. I don't know if renovation or replacement is, is the right language, um, but I understand that it has needed that for some significant time. That's been, that's been well known. So uh, what are the plans uh, to update the building and, and what is the timeline for that? And why wasn't it contemplated in the scope of this project? Mr. O'Connor. Uh, I'll take that question and I'll start off with the, uh, the, the uh, focus of this project uh, was to move the services from the Victoria General site 
uh, elsewhere. And the elsewhere, most of it is, uh, most of the uh, new construction will be at the Halifax Infirmary site, as we all now know. Um, and of course, Bayers Lake site and Dartmouth General. So we did not, uh, this project did not include uh, scope to um, do many other things. There are many other healthcare projects underway in Nova Scotia and in, and in this area as well that are not necessarily uh, part of the scope of the QE2 re regeneration project, but they, they're being planned uh, maybe separately but together. So, so many, there are many other projects like the dialysis projects and, and uh, others that are currently underway. Um, the Abbey J Lane specifically, I do not know. I know we have some uh, spillover between this project and the Abbey J Lane, uh, just around some some changes we're making around loading docks and, and things of that nature, uh, because the loading docks are tucked in behind the Abbey J Lane, and we're moving those to to uh, to a different location or, or some of them uh, in the in the redevelopment project. But inside the building, on the, the various floors. Um, I'm not familiar with what uh, is planned for those floors. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to, I think it was Dr. Mitchell's comment early on about um, planning at the coal face uh, with, uh, with actual healthcare staff and support staff um, who, are, who are working in, these, in the current facilities. Um, I had a, a recent conversation with a psychiatrist uh, about the number of people who are actually um, inpatients at the Abbey Lane who actually need supportive housing in the community, but there isn't housing, there isn't adequate supportive housing in the community, and so they are inpatients. Of course, on uh, at the VG site, we have wards of um, of inpatients who actually uh, need long-term care beds, but they are. Um, they are currently ALC uh, patients uh, in an acute care setting. In both of those cases, we are we are providing very expensive housing or very expensive care that is actually inappropriate for um, for the individuals who are who are in those beds. So when I look at the um, health redevelopment site and I see that uh, there are going to be, I think I saw the numbers here, six hundred and twenty six beds. Um, 626 beds, an increase of 180, 30 wicks, 36 of which are new, 144 relocated from the VG site. Is, is the starting assumption for planning that we are going to continue to have significant numbers of alternate lo level of care patients in an acute care um, hospital? Um, uh, or are we going to start doing better in these other parts of, of the system that touch um, and impact on the acute care hospital setting? Dr. Mitchell. So uh, recognizing that I represent the redevelopment, I'll speak as a physician and representative of the organization and say, you know, what you describe is actively a daily, really complicated issue, right? So um, alternative level of care patients, long-term care capacity, the number of things that contribute to a patient still existing in a long-term, in an alternative level of care in our existing facilities or mental health patients in the wrong bed, in the wrong place, that's a really co a complex issue that requires uh, the cooperation and collaboration of a variety of different levels uh, to solve that issue and is quite a bit beyond uh, what we currently are planning in terms of acute care beds. Uh, on, you know, in any given context, you know, our plan around acute care beds when we create them is we're not creating them with the, the, uh, the lens on that well, we'd like to create this and, and create alternative level of care bed space or that this is what we really want to do. The active reality is, is that that is an ongoing pressure for the system. Um, uh, but the new acute care capacity in the new buildings was not envisaged to be alternative level of care beds or to house long-term mental health patients or otherwise it was to service the acute care needs of the facilities. The needs of uh, uh, mental health inpatients, uh, alternative level of care or otherwise is a much larger issue that is you know, beyond our scope. It's certainly one that is very important to the health authority to manage. Ms. Roberts with about two minutes left. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, maybe if, uh, 
in writing, perhaps, because of my short time, um, I would be curious to know if the 144 beds being relocated from the VG site, if those are currently ALC beds or if those are acute care and cancer care uh, beds. Um, Dr. Mitchell? Those, those are predominantly acute care beds. Those are not planned alternative level care beds presently. Okay. Ms. Roberts? Thank you. The AG report points out that the public will only see the value in um, that is a su you know, suggested purported to come from a design build finance maintain model if contract management is significantly improved. This has been a me major weakness in the past with spotty enforcement of terms and deliverables. Um, administering and managing contracts is a complex task which uh, will need to continue long past many of your, uh, you know, stays in the public service. Um, how much are the departments anticipating spending on managing and administering the, the QE2 redevelopment contracts? Mr. Porter. Uh, I'm not sure I can place a dollar value on it. We, we built capability within Nova Scotia lands within our team uh, to actively manage the contracts that uh, as, the, as they come, uh, come to be. So in Bayers Lake, uh, we have uh, assigned specific responsibilities within the three divisions that we have. So in procurement and finance, there are some responsibilities in contract management. Our infrastructure group has some responsibilities through the works phase and, and uh, in the construction management realm. Uh, and the clinical team uh, also in terms of advancing the design. So the project agreement spells out all the obligations that are on the province and Project Co. We've taken those obligations and we built, have, we've built a project implementation plan or a contract management manual. We've created the right committee structures. We've put the right people on them. We have accountability assigned for those obligations within our, within our organization and we will be actively uh, managing and monitoring the, uh, the contract uh, uh, through the construction period. We still have a little bit more work to do to define the, uh, our contract uh, management approach in the operating period, but that's also well defined in the, in the project agreement. So it's really taking those obligations that were, uh, that were contracted to perform and embedding them into our, into our organization. I apologize, I'm going to have to cut that discussion off because the time for the NDP caucus has expired. We'll go now to the Liberal caucus for eight minutes, beginning with Mr. Jessup. Mr. Jessup. Thank you. Through the chair, the AG's report acknowledged a couple of different variances between uh, a couple of different programs that had um, less space uh, provided then was outlined in the in the master plan. Um, Mr. Porter alluded to some of the the back and forth that uh, kind of lessons learned that that has taken place since Bayer's Lake to the infirmary uh, with respect to the engagement of to the, the medical community and I'd like the our, our medical director to weigh in on that relationship um, the medical, uh, the medical community, or the medical director's capacity to um, to be involved, to okay and give feedback, uh, and and additionally, on top of that kind of protocol that's been realized, um, reassure us that the Bears Lake site was not a burnt pancake, a first, burnt first pancake. Please and thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that question. This, no question, it, uh, was a journey uh, and a learning exercise, uh, but we did uh, learn quickly. Our teams have developed significant proficiency, and when I say our teams, both on the infrastructure side, but also on the clinical side, and it is about being able to understand how each other think, think and speak, understanding the language between the two groups, and as we got through the COC process, we began to get to that place where you know, Gary and I, you know, we, we work extremely closely, uh, where I understand what Gary is saying and what Gary understands what I am saying. Saying, and I will reassure uh, both everybody here and the public that uh, the clinical voice and uh, folks like myself have had a significant seat and, a, and voice uh, in the design meetings, in the open period with the proponents. 
Uh, and what we have, it, you know, through the PC, P3 process with the COC is, yeah, lessons learned, and we learned some really good ones, what to do, what not to do uh, in the HI open period. But during the process of the COC, with the collaboration that uh, uh, Mr. Porter uh, uh, described, you know, we got a really great product. You know, we took the things that we asked for, and we asked the market to solve a bunch of our problems. And we, what we ended up with was a building that was actually more efficient, uh, 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 had everything in it that we had asked for at a aff very affordable price that we are going to be absolutely thrilled with. And we've shown those at the coal face some of those updated designs that have been built out of the open period, and they are thrilled. It does capture what they asked for, and it, we do think it was a real success. So we didn't burn that pancake. We learned a lot while we made it, but we didn't burn it. Mr. Jessup. Oh, Mr. Costanzo. Thank you very much. And I, I was hoping that you will be able to finish up the, the question from the, the volume that is expected for Bayer's Lake, but I also wanted to bring one other uh, item when I was speaking is uh, that most people don't know, and I actually lived in Clayton Park area for 35 years, and I didn't know the, the, uh, the wilderness that is so close right now to your new hospital. This is a huge advantage for the employees, for the staff that would be working at the hospital, and for the visitors. Uh, there is an actual access point that is right next to the hospital, I'm told. Has this been looked at as an advantage of the location and, and any signage, any opportunity to make sure that, that both the staff and the visitors know about this and take advantage of it? Dr. Mitchell. Yeah, got it. Uh, oh, absolutely. So uh, uh, briefly, back to your volume question, 207,000 visits at the COC site uh, annually. Uh, is the overall volume expected to go there? Uh, and a facility that, as your question, is it big enough? And the answer is yes. You know what? It, it is uh, well sized to accommodate the kind of volumes and the activities we need to do there. Absolutely. I have a lot of confidence in that. Uh, in terms of the outside, yeah, absolutely. We spent <laughs> many hours uh, during the open period discussing gardens and paths and lighting and access to nature and where staff might eat their lunches outside, where patients might go. How do we get, you know, there's things in the contract about bike trails, access to the, uh, the bus station, among other things. And, uh, you know, I, like you, I, I lived in Clayton Park for uh, many years and used to mountain bike up behind uh, all those areas, so I'm very familiar with it. Uh, and there is absolutely lots of nature, tra nature trail access there, and it does represent a great location for those kind of activities. And the people attending that facility can experience that, should they wish. Mr. LaFleche. Yeah, I want to thank you for that question. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, misinformation around the bike trails and not having a bike trail at the Bears Lake Community Outpatient Clinic. In fact, there, that's one of the few sites uh, that does have a bike trail, so that, that is really a bad piece of information that somehow got out there. In fact, we just, uh, at, at the end of September, beginning of October, the, uh, the ride for cancer for leukemia and lymphoma started from that new site uh, onto uh, the, the, the HRM bike trail that goes out uh, down the South Shore. So it's very well serviced, and uh, what's one of the reasons why that site was very advantageous. Thank you. Mr. Costanzo, two minutes left. Thank you very much, and I hope, uh, um, uh, it, you know, people will hear about it and some signage and some work between the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes Society and the hospital, because that's an access point that is really uh, uh, wonderful, and hopefully that people can use the parking lot to use that access point as well. So I'm not sure how big the parking and where it is, but these are two things that can work well together. Thank you again. And I pass it on to my colleague, um, uh, Mr. McGuire. Uh, Mr. Brand, uh, Brandon McGuire. Mr. McGuire. I go with Mr. Brendan. Um, so we've had uh, a lot of questions here today about uh, this development uh, and how, how much of an impact uh, that it's going to have on Nova Scotians. Uh, to say that it's long overdue is an understatement. Uh, I think all of us at, at some point have frequented the uh, medical facilities here in, in Nova Scotia. Um, we have fantastic staff that are working at those facilities, but the truth is, is that we need uh, to upgrade that and, and, and to modernize it. Uh, what kind of impact, uh, in your opinions, is this going to have on recruitment? Recruitment of staff? And they just turned around and looked at Ms. Dr. Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell, uh, you have one minute to answer that question. 
great. Recognizing that I grew up visiting the old Dartmouth General and my mom worked there for 23 years and now I've watched it convert into what it is today so you can go see that. Um, it's beautiful. Facilities has a huge impact on nursing staff and clinicians and where they decide to work. Uh, people do not want to come to uh, antiquated facilities. They want to graduate and come to the newest best buildings with the newest best technologies in them and that's where they want to work. These buildings will absolutely contribute to the recruitment of quality and uh, uh, future healthcare uh, providers. Thank you. The time for the second round of questioning has expired. So now uh, what we'll do is open the floor. If you, if the witnesses want to make closing remarks, you're welcome to do so. We're going to start with Mr. LaFleche. I think you're going to start and finish with me, actually. There's oh, okay. no one else. Um, so I want to thank uh, the committee. We've been here several times to talk about uh, the, uh, the redevelopment of healthcare facilities in Nova Scotia. And I say in Nova Scotia because we have a lot of facilities we, where we are redeveloping. The QE2 is part of them. They're all interlinked. They're all part of a plan, as Dr. Mitchell outlined. Um, you know, I can mention some in Cape Breton, Pugwash, uh, Yarmouth. These are all recent announcements that we've made, good announcements that will provide great service for Nova Scotians. It's not about the facility. It's about the service and health care they're going to get. So I want to thank you. Every time we come here, you asked insightful questions. There were some good ones today. And, uh, but I want, to, I want to maybe finish on two thoughts. The first thought is the ongoing uh, contract monitoring. That was brought up by, uh, by Madame Roberts. And um, that is uh, a key point that's brought up in the Auditor General report. Uh, I think it's important that people read that report. Uh, ongoing monitoring and, and, and relationship management with P3 is critical to achieving the benefits that Gary Porter talked about. Um, so in the past, that's been uh, maybe a spotty record for various governments around uh, Canada and North America. We have to do a very good job of that. So the job doesn't end with the build. The job goes on for 35 years. And as we've seen with the schools, where maybe things over the last 25 years might have been a bit lax in the monitoring area, monitoring delivers you a great result at the end if you do it properly. So we will... Uh, we, 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 all, we will endeavor to have a group that specifically works on that. Gary mentioned that. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is that um, we're public servants. We want to do the best job we can for you. We want to make sure you get, a, you get a good build and good health care. We take risks. We take risks on behalf of the public, but they're, they're managed risks, they're calculated, and we try and do the best things we can to build these facilities. Sometimes mistakes are made, and sometimes uh, we hit a home run, so to speak. And uh, for the last 35 years in healthcare in Nova Scotia, John O'Connor has built virtually, or been involved in virtually every build, and uh, he will probably not appear here again. He's going off into the sunset. But slowly, he'll be with us for another year. He doesn't know that yet. <laughs> in a part-time role. And we'll be hiring a, a replacement who will appear uh, in the near future. Uh, but I think it's important that we acknowledge that uh, whether it's uh, an infirmary, a hospital in Amherst, in Yarmouth, wherever it is in Nova Scotia, John O'Connor has been involved in those facilities. He's put his hand on it. He's got experience. He could have earned a lot more money, multiple times more money working in the private sector for uh, different consultants, but he chose to have a career in public service, and that's what's important. So I want to just go out uh, thanking John for his uh, long uh, career in public service. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Th thank you uh, very much. Uh, I think Mr. O'Connor wants to have a response. Maybe he's not going now. <laughs> Mr. O'Connor. I won't take uh, much time. I just say thank you very much, Paul, for those remarks. I guess that really means I have to leave, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about it. Not for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, on behalf of the committee, to you, Mr. O'Connor, thank you for your service to the province of Nova Scotia. And Look forward to a happy retirement for you. So that uh, concludes our presentation today. There's just one thing I'd like to bring up if I could. Uh, at the start of discussion, there was questions about numbers and uh, we have gotten some of those numbers, but the commitment was made that the committee would be provided these numbers. And I would ask if you would 
please forward those numbers to the to the clerk and we can go from there. Okay, Mr. LaPlush. Two follow-ups I have. One is the one you just mentioned, and I think many of those are already on the website, but we will endeavor to follow up. And uh, the second is uh, Ms. LeBlanc mentioned the union consultations. So Ms. Bond is going to follow up uh, with uh, Ms. LeBlanc on the union council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, that, that concludes our witnesses for this morning. What we'll do is just take a break for a couple of minutes to give the, the witnesses the opportunity to leave the room, and then we'll finish off with our committee business. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll move back now to uh, committee business and uh, uh, Mr. Hallman. Uh, I'd like to put forward a motion, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, by my count, as of today, it's been 239 days since the legislature sat. Uh, we know that this is a, a government, Mr. Chair, that struggles with accountability and transparency. We know that this is a government that um, it finds it very challenging to answer questions of the opposition, uh, of the media. Fairly recently, uh, the Premier uh, indicated to a reporter that uh, I'm not your research team. And so here we are at public accounts, the mandate of public accounts, despite the alterations uh, made by the Liberal caucus in the fall of 2018. The purpose of the, the committee is to question government spending. So therefore, Mr. Chair, I would, I'd like to put a motion forward that, that is the following. Recently, the federal government gave the province of Nova Scotia $228 million in COVID-19 stimulus funding. The province has been unable or unwilling to give details about how that taxpayer money will be spent. The government is not disclosing this information. Therefore, I move th that this committee invite the Department of Transportation and appropriate staff to this committee at the earliest possible date to explain how this $228 million will be used in Nova Scotia. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Okay. Recorded vote. Uh, recorded vote. Again, I'll go back to our sheet and I'll call according to the way people are seated. Ms. Roberts. Yes. Mr. Holman. Yes. Mr. Irving. No. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Jessup. No. Mr. DeConstanzo. Ms. DeConstanzo. No. Mr. McGuire. No. Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. And I will vote yes as well. So the motion has been defeated. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hobbin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One final motion to put forward with your permission. Uh, this is a motion endorsing the Auditor General recommendations. Mr. Chair, I move that the Public Accounts Committee formally accept and endorse recommendations contained in the following reports. The June 2020 report of the Auditor General, Nova Scotia Liquor Commission Phase 1. July 14, 2020 report of the Auditor General, QE2 New Generation Project, Halifax Infirmary Expansion and Community Outpatient Centre Phase 2 and the July 28, 2020 report of the Auditor General, Government-Wide Contaminated Sites. We move that this be accepted by the audited departments or agencies and ask that those departments and agencies commit to and take responsibility for full and timely implementation of the recommendations accepted by those departments and agencies. We have a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? 
Hearing none, all those, uh, Mr. Jessup. So just to clarify, this is, that was kind of a lengthy way of saying we accept the report of the Auditor General. It's a standard. Okay. Standard one. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's a little lengthy too as well because there is some direction in the motion for, okay. So having heard the motion, all those in favor, give your consent by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded. The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, just a few more items, if I could. Uh, there's some correspondence that the committee members have received, and we'd just like to get uh, this on the public record. First piece of correspondence was the Department of Environment. The response to the committee correspondence requesting an update on the implementation of recommendations from the November 1, 2017 Auditor General Report. The second from the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing, response to the committee correspondence requesting an update on the implementation from the November 2016 report. And thirdly, the Office of Aboriginal Affairs, response to the committee correspondence requesting an update on the implementation of recommendations from the June 2015 Auditor General Report. So those are received uh, for the committee at this point. So uh, is there any further business to come before the meeting today? Any further business? I expected, uh, I got to apologize, I expected with so many witnesses here today that the closing of your remarks would be actually longer than they were. And, Surprised that Mr. LaFleche was as short as he was. <laughs> so have, if there's no further business to come before the meeting, uh, just our next uh, meeting is on December 9th here in the chamber, where there will be an in-camera briefing from 8.30 to 9. Public accounts will sit from 9 to 11. And the witness is the Office of the Auditor General and Department of Finance concerning the December 2020 report of the Auditor General Financial. So if there's no further business, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you all.